This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Beloved, welcome to worship with Shandon Presbyterian Church. Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whenever you might be watching, thank you for joining your spirit with ours during this time together. Shandon strives to be a community of authentic welcome and genuine hospitality. So know this, there is always a place for you here. Some announcements for our life together this week. A reminder that today during worship, we celebrate the sacrament of communion. So this is a good time to press pause and go and find some bread and juice or wine or crackers or whatever you have in your pantry. Jesus used bread and wine because that's what he had readily available to him. The, maj the majesty and mystery of the sacrament that we celebrate is in the story we remember and in the love it conveys, not so much in the elements that we consume. So whatever you have will be just fine. I also want to share with you that at outdoor worship this afternoon, we will celebrate the baptism of Nathan Roberts, son of Bryant and Sarah Roberts. Now, outdoor worship today is filled to capacity with pre-registered attendees. So if you have not signed up for today, but would like to worship with us outdoors and in person in the future, we encourage you to sign up early in the week. Thank you again to all of you who attended our annual congregational meeting last week. We had nearly 100 of you in attendance, and it was a wonderful and lovely thing to look back at a year, even though it has held challenges, and to look ahead at all of the potential and excitement that is to come. At that meeting, you voted to approve the terms of call for your pastors, and you also voted to approve the slate of officers for the class of 2024 and members of the nominating committee for this year. And I thank you for that. Now, lastly, there was the incentive of a virtual door prize for those who attended. We had gift cards to three local businesses. So in a random drawing, Laura Covington won a gift card to Crave. Leck Patterson won a gift card to the Mediterranean Tea Room. And Robin Bacon won a gift card to the local Buzz. The three of you can stop by the church and pick up those gift cards at any point, or if you prefer, we are happy to bring them to you. Just let us know your preference. Arts at Shandon is excited to promote its next event. Dr. Ron Davis, Professor Emeritus at Presbyterian College, will present an organ concert that will premiere online March 18th at 6 p.m. on both Facebook and YouTube. The concert will be pre-recorded. Now I have heard him rehearsing and I can assure you that we are in for a treat. So I hope that you will join us either online as it premieres or shortly thereafter and enjoy some truly beautiful music. And thank you to Arts at Shandon for continuing your ministry even in this online season. We are in the midst of Lent, but Easter is coming and with it, Easter lilies. You are invited to remember or honor a loved one by sponsoring a lily that will grace our sanctuary and our outdoor worship space this Easter. The deadline to sponsor a lily is 4 p.m. on Friday, March 26th. You can order one online through our website or contact Jess Joyner in the church office for more information. Now, speaking of Easter, we will have a number of outdoor worship services that morning. Registration for these services will open on Wednesday, March 10th. At present, we are planning on three services, but don't worry. If demand is there, we will schedule as many as we need in order to assure that everyone who wants to worship in person on Easter is able to do so. Now, lastly, we do have some pastoral care concerns to share with you this week. We ask that you remember in your prayers Janet McGrew, who is recovering from surgery that took place earlier in the week, Susan Chapel, who is in the hospital, and Elizabeth Grimble and her family as she continues on hospice care. 
We also ask that you pray for David Kirkpatrick and Drew Kirkpatrick as they grieve the death of their mother, Del Kirkpatrick, last Sunday. We also pray for Garrett and Jordan Humphreys as they grieve the death of Garrett's grandmother, Catherine O'Donnell. We come together in prayer because we trust and because scripture promises us that it is both powerful and effective. So let us now worship God, the one who hears our prayers and holds us close, moving us ever closer to life. Please join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Day is full of speech, night is filled with knowledge, joy envelops it all. The law of the Lord is perfect, it revives our soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, they increase our wisdom. The guidance of the Lord is certain, it lights up our path. The Lord's instruction is more desired than any gold and sweeter than any honey. The Lord is our rock and our redeemer. As beloved children of God, we strive to be in right relationship with God and with each other. Part of that call is also claiming and acknowledging when we fall short of it. So with that in mind, would you join me in today's prayer of confession? Lord God, forgive us. Lost in ourselves, we dwell endlessly on yesterday's embarrassment, anger, and grief. Lost in our domain, it is hard to see beyond yesterday's fighting, suspicion, and fear. Lost in our fantasy, it is tempting to live in yesterday's illusions. So fill us with the spirit of Jesus Christ, that we might be lost in the wonder and sanity of your hope.
Amen. Friends, the good news is that God's confidence in our ability to get up and try again is unending, and we are equipped to do so with the grace of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let us share signs of peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm glad you've joined me down here at the front for the Word for Children. Now, I'm glad you're up close to your computer screen or your television, because this time is just for you. I wonder, I've noticed something, and I wonder if you've noticed it too, that there are rules for everything. There are rules for the playground. You might hear the kids outside playing right now. There are rules for school. There are rules for home. There are rules for riding your bike. There are rules for crossing the street. There are rules in church. And there are even rules in the Bible. There are rules everywhere. Now, as I've thought about rules this week, I think there are two types of rules. The first type of rule is a rule to keep you safe, to make sure you don't get hurt. So those are types of rules like don't run in the hall at church or at school. You might run into somebody, a teacher or another student, fall down and get hurt. Or on the playground, don't have two people on the sliding board at one time because you might bump into the person in front of you. Cross the road with a parent and look both ways or wear a bike helmet anytime you bike. Those are good rules that help keep you safe and make sure you don't get hurt. Now, the other type of rule is a rule that helps you be better, feel better, be who God wants you to be. Now, this type of rule um, is you can think about in eating or the dinner table. Your parents um, want you to eat green things, vegetables and... Um, and not a lot of junk or caffeinated drinks or sodas or those kind of things. And there's even a rule about getting a certain amount of vegetables and fruits and lean proteins every day. So that is a rule that helps you be better, grow bigger and stronger and feel better too and feel healthier. In the Bible, we have 10 rules, 10 commandments. They're called commandments. Say commandments with me. Commandments. Good job. 10 rules that help us be better. Help us be better. Feel better. Be who God wants us to be who he's calling us to be, the best version of ourselves. So there are rules like worship only God. Don't worship things or toys or people. Worship only God. Set aside one day a week to rest and to think about your God and worship your God. There are rules about not stealing not lying, rules about not hitting or hurting or kicking or killing. Those are rules that help us be better. There's also a rule about following the guidance of your mom and dad. There's also a rule about being happy with what you have. There are 10 rules, 10 commandments in the Bible that help us be better, feel better, 
and be what God is calling us to be. This day, I hope you will remember the two types of rules and the rules that God gives us in Exodus in the Bible that help us be better, feel better, treat other people better, treat ourselves better, and help us be who God wants us to be. Let us go to God in prayer. God, we give you thanks for your rules, your Ten Commandments. Help us to live out these commandments so we might be better, feel better, behave better, treat other people better, and be who you want us to be in relationship to you and to your world and to our family and friends and strangers and everyone. In your son's name we pray, amen. Now, boys and girls, you can go back to sit with your families and enjoy the rest of worship. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. First, let us pray. Almighty God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as scripture is read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. God spoke all these words to Moses on Mount Sinai. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is, in, that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it, honoring your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When it comes to the Ten Commandments, I can't help but think about Judge Roy Moore. Do you remember him? He was on two occasions the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Alabama. He was removed on both occasions. He most recently ran for a Senate seat in 2020. But the reason that most people remember him is because of a controversy around a large monument that he had commissioned and installed inside the Alabama State Judiciary Building. The enormous statue included a giant copy of the Ten Commandments. Now to make a long story shorter, the monument was not permitted to remain in place and so the judge hauled it from one public appearance to another before finally laying it to rest, so to speak, at his own Foundation for Moral Law in downtown Montgomery, 
just about a year ago. Now, don't worry if you missed this. There were a few other things happening just about a year ago. But the monument's reinstallation brought to light a few key details about it, including the fact that Judge Moore's Ten Commandments weighed a total of 5,280 pounds. If you do the math, that's more than 500 pounds per commandment. And when the granite statue was put in its final place, a five-ton crane buckled under the weight of it. I wonder sometimes if that's how these Ten Commandments feel to us, impossibly heavy, causing even the most righteous and upright among us to buckle underneath their weight. And I wonder that especially since we find ourselves focusing on them just two weeks after we explored God's covenant with Noah. Now that covenant was unconditional, remember? God said, I will never again destroy the earth by flooding it. And nothing, not one thing, was asked of Noah or anyone else. But that is not the case with Moses and the Ten Commandments. The condition comes just a few verses beforehand. God says to Moses, remember now that I set you free. Therefore... If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. You shall be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. If, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. And that if, it's enough to make your shoulders sag and your spirits sink isn't it? It's two little letters, but they contain the weight of the world, a world that so often says you will be loved to the exact extent that you earn it. You will be valued in direct proportion to what you produce or achieve. You will be considered faithful as long as you live flawlessly. You will be offered the promise, but only if you can prove you're worthy of it. That's what that if and all of the instructions that follow it seem to carry. Unless we get carried away and say to ourselves, that's just the way of the Old Testament, I'll point your attention to the Gospel of John chapter 15 in which Jesus says, you are my friends if you keep my commands. Whenever I find myself flummoxed by scripture or even disappointed by it, I generally take that to mean I haven't plumbed its depths adequately. And so in my study this week, I read and reread every word of the book of Exodus several times. Here's what I finally noticed. The Ten Commandments are situated very carefully in that book. The story of Exodus before the commandments is the story of Israel's enslavement in Egypt and the way that God delivers them from bondage into freedom. The story of Exodus after the commandments are handed off is the recitation of astonishingly detailed instructions about where they should reside. It is astonishingly detailed instruction, all geared towards creating something breathtakingly beautiful, with acacia wood and fine linen, with blues and purples and crimson, with golden threads and careful metalwork. What I'm saying is this. On the one side of the commandments is freedom, and on the other side of the commandments is beauty. Perhaps, just perhaps, what sits right in the middle is in fact not intended to be heavy or hard, 
but rather something that is part of that same transcendent trajectory from freedom into beauty. Surely God would not liberate God's people from slavery only to shackle them to another impossible and inhumane way of living. Surely God is not so cruel or conniving as that would require. I have come to believe wholeheartedly that God gives us the commandments so that we might have the best chance possible at a life that is replete with freedom and beauty, not weighted down with burden, but rather light enough that we can, in Scripture's own words, soar on the wings of eagles. Now I know, I know that that is a far cry and a long leap from if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. But don't miss this. Moses is the one who carried the tablets that said, you shall not murder. But Moses himself once took a human life. And as for the rest of God's people, well, Moses comes down the mountain with the first set of tablets, only to find them dancing around as they put the finishing touches on a golden calf. Moses is so upset by this that he drops the tablets, but as theologian Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, Moses let the tablets break, but only because the people had already broken them. If remaining in right relationship with God, and there's that if again, if remaining in right relationship with God requires full and perfect obedience to the law, then friends, it would have been over and done with right then and there. If a mistake or a misstep was enough for God to wipe his hands clean and brush the dust off her sandals and call it a day, if disappointment was reason enough for God to desert us, if wrong answers or a third strike or spilled milk or a golden calf were enough for God to give up on us, that would have been that. And the Bible would be a heck of a lot shorter than it is. But it wasn't. And it isn't. Exodus shows us clearly that left to our own devices, we humans are a bit of a hot mess and a mixed bag. But that is not new information for God. We have been that way from the beginning. And even still, God keeps choosing to love us. The commandments that God issues as part of the covenant with Moses, they are not conditions on that promise. They are actually part of the promise itself. God is not making love conditional. God is actually extending what love looks like and how far love can reach. It was love that compelled God to set the Israelites free, to give them their lives back. And it is love that compels God to issue some commandments so that those lives so that those lives would be worth living. How about this? God says, Honor the Lord your God, because I am the one who has brought you this far already. I am your source and your strength, and I am your road home. Don't waste your time worshiping anything other than me. Because at some point, in some way, it will let you down and it will break your heart. So spare yourself that pain, won't you? Don't use my name casually. You know my name because I have drawn close to you. And I will never be casual in my treatment of you. I promise. Remember the Sabbath because it will give you a chance to take a break from what you do and remember who you are. Honor your parents, whoever they are, because good or bad, they are the reason you can breathe. They gave you your place in the story. Now, honoring is not the same as idolizing or even obeying. 
Because yes, relationships are complex. What I'm saying is remember that none of us got where we are all on our own. Do not murder. Do not take a life and do not sit quietly or complacently by as another life is taken. Do not withhold from anyone that which is life-giving, whether it is rights or respect, space or security, food or freedom. Do not compromise the trust someone places in you. Do not ever forget how fragile the human heart is, a heart that beats but also a heart that breaks. When you are presented with an opportunity to knowingly rupture a relationship, resist it at all costs, because the resulting burden is so heavy, it will weigh upon everyone, even you. Do not take what isn't yours. And while we're at it, don't take more than you could ever need either. There's more than enough once you figure out that life has never been a zero-sum game. Do not bear false witness. Do not spread stories of false news. Your word is your bond and only the truth will set you free. If along the way you forget what truth is or what it looks like or sounds like, remember this, I am the way and I am the truth, and I am the life. Do not wish you had what others have. It is a slippery slope that ensures happiness will always elude you. Rejoice with those who rejoice, give thanks for what you have, and eventually you too will discover that the only treasures worth having are heavenly ones. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So set your heart free. That's what I'm trying to tell you. These are the commandments I am giving you, God says. Because I set you free once already from everything that held you down and held you back. And this instruction, this guidance, it is your best chance of taking the life I have given you and living it to its fullest and best capacity. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I know. I know God says, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. We are God's people. We are God's treasured possession. There is no way around it. But if we obey God's voice and keep God's covenant, well, then we'll never forget it. We'll never forget that we are God's treasure, that we are God's beloved. And before you know it, we'll find ourselves living like we believe it's true too. Robert Wuthno, an American sociologist, he says that stories and memories can become so planted in our minds that they act back upon us. He tells the story of Jack Casey, a volunteer firefighter who, as a child, had some teeth pulled under general anesthesia. Jack was terrified, but one of the nurses said, don't worry, I'll be right here beside you, no matter what happens. I'll be right here the whole time. And when Jack woke up, he saw that she had kept her word. She was still standing right beside him. Twenty years later, Mr. Casey was called to the scene of an accident. The driver was pinned upside down in his truck, and Jack crawled inside to try and release him from the wreckage. Gas was dripping on them both, and power tools were ultimately required to get the driver out. The whole time, the man kept repeating that he was afraid to die, that he didn't want to die, and every time Jack replied to him, don't worry. I'll be right here beside you the entire time, no matter what happens. I'll be right here the whole time. Later, after the man was safe, the driver told Jack, 
you are an idiot. What were you thinking? If anything had gone wrong, you would have died too. In reply, Jack simply said, somewhere deep inside of me, I just knew I couldn't leave you. I think that's the way the commandments work. We are found, we are rescued, we are set free. And what follows is a life beautifully shaped around and in response to that liberating act of love. I'll be right here beside you, no matter what happens. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of slavery. Freedom on one side, beauty on the other. And the gift of our lives, friends, is tucked right in between. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, God meets us in the light. Moments of laughter with friends, outside when we walk our dog, through the voice of a loved one over the phone. God also meets us in the middle of the night, before the sun rises, before the wound heals. When we open our laptops to press yet again another Zoom link, and in the deepest corners of our minds where we wonder if we are enough. And if God meets us in all of those places, then surely God meets us here, at this table, at this meal. Regardless of whatever table stands before you or whatever elements are upon it, know that it is the Lord's table and the elements upon it are from God's holy abundance. Christ is the host. You are invited. So come. Let us keep the joyful feast together. Let us pray. Holy God, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, Father and mother of us all, the hallowing of your name echoes throughout the universe. 
God, you are before all things, you are beyond all things, and in the midst of all things and all peoples, you have made yourself known. In Israel's ancient codes and prophets, in the gift of your commandments to Moses, in stories of communities and nations seeking identity, feeling their strength and struggling with their weaknesses, you have made yourself known. In Jesus of Nazareth, in compassion for the outcast, forgiveness for the fallen, hope for the poor and hungry, in his life poured out for others and broken in rejection and disdain, you have made yourself known. As Jesus broke bread before the brokenness of his death, as he poured out wine before his blood was poured out on the cross, as he gave his life in acts of goodness, as he invited all to the feast of new hope, so too come to us, God of Jesus, in your love. Meet us here and heal those who are battling illness or injury. Bind up those who are barely holding the pieces of their broken hearts together. Reign peace over places where violence claims dominion. Help us restore parts of creation where we have caused destruction and continue to instruct us in your ways as we seek to follow you. Come to us, Holy Spirit. Meet us here and let the bread and wine before us bear your life to our life. Nourish us with Christ's vision of hope and sustain us for our Lenten journey. Nourish us with your brokenness. Renew us with your poured out life. Empower us with your powerlessness that we may take root in your risen life and bear fruit in your world. Hear us now as we pray all of these things together using the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he first sat at a table in an upper room with his closest friends. And after supper, he took ordinary bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take Eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Friends, each time we gather at this table, and we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do so proclaiming the saving death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again in glory. So come, let us keep the feast. The bread of life. The cup of salvation. Let us pray. O Lord, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only at your table, but wherever we go. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope when the night is its darkest. 
wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies and spirits and hearts need healing and continue to transform us all as we journey this Lenten way together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every time we eat from this table, remembering Jesus Christ, we remember all that God has given to us. The bounty of blessings that overflow this table and all the tables of our lives. For each and everything has come from God. We are amazingly blessed. Filled now with Christ's Spirit, let us give in faithful response to all our many blessings. Let us give of ourselves, our time, our talents, our resources, our money, and our prayers so that we too might live out the Ten Commandments and be who God has called us to be as we give graciously, generously, let us now give, give and give and give, this day and every day. Friends, may joy and nothing less follow you all the days of your life. May you be blessed and may you be a blessing. And may you rest well today, secure in the knowledge that the Lord of light, who has brought you this far already, will lead you and countless others all the way home. Amen.